your life. All right, so uh, my name is Justin James, and I am uh, your paladin. That's uh, your toast and y'all tonight. Uh, first of all, thank y'all for coming. But uh, not paladin. Uh, we work with several different uh, IT jobs. Uh, we have network admins, we work with developers, engineers, a little bit of everything, um, and several different industries as well. Retail. Uh, we have uh, telecommunications. Um, and if you are looking for a job or, uh, or know anyone that is, feel free to check out our website. It's www.paladin-inc.com. And, uh, and once again, thank you all for coming to Great. Thanks a lot. Yeah. All right. So uh, tonight we've got the pleasure of having David, is it Mosher or Mosher? Mosher. Mosher. All right. So we've got David Mosher tonight, and, uh, and he's going to be talking about grunt and linemen. Uh, in, in front end workflows, and so uh, we're excited to have him. So uh, we'll let you introduce yourself, and, uh, and then you can go ahead and get started. Perfect. Can you guys uh, see my screen okay? We sure can. All right. Uh, thanks for the introduction. Um, yeah, my name's uh, David Moser. I'm from Canada, and I work uh, with Shopify, uh, who does a pretty significant amount of e-commerce hosting and basically the simplest platform that you can uh, use to sell things online basically. Uh, and I have been spending the last uh, five years really focusing on um, the idea of taking front-end development and promoting it to a first-class citizen within an organization. Uh, and there's sort of been a number of tools that have enabled that uh, to happen, and one of them is Grunt, and Grunt is uh, it's basically a task runner similar to Make or CMake or Ant, uh, if you're familiar with task runners in other languages, um, and it's written in JavaScript, and a lot of the tasks that have been written uh, for Grunt are oriented at the front end, and Lineman is a very small wrapper uh, around a couple of tools, one of which is Grunt, that provides some convention and configuration um, similar to the ideas that Ruby on Rails brought to server-side web app development. Uh, we've basically taken a, some of those that make sense, a very light subset, and um, taken them to front-end development with the goal of, of uh, making front-end web development uh, as seamless and uh, as enjoyable as server-side development with um, various MVC frameworks. So that's what we're going to talk about today. Uh, Lineman was actually built by uh, a company called Test Double, which is where I used to work before Shopify. And Test Double is a consultancy based out of Columbus, Ohio, that provides um, a lot of specialty and expertise around front-end uh, web development, um, really applying craftsmanship and the idea of solid software development practices to the front end, which I think is often sorely missing. Um, the response that I've typically heard at different organizations is, well, it's just JavaScript or it's just HTML and CSS, so why should we you know, care about it? And that, that neglect um, really is, is unfortunate, and I think uh, Test Double um, and working with them really sort of taught me about uh, how to approach teaching server-side developers about craftsmanship and quality on the front end. As I mentioned, I work at Shopify now, and the the product or the area of Shopify that I got hired to work on is the admin interface, which is one of the largest um, single-page app or sort of rich client MVC apps in production. Um, uh, it's sort of this single view um, that's loaded, and then all of the interactions that happen within the application um, basically never trigger a full page reload. There's a JSON API that pipes uh, JSON from the, the server side to the client um, and the sort of deploy artifact for this application is you know a couple of balls of JavaScript and pre-compiled templates and so um, one of the things that uh, I've really sort of dug into working here has been um, with the idea of looking at tooling like Grunt and Lineman how can we take those tools and apply them to get uh, a modern workflow for Shopify? And so that's one of the things that we rolled out was now all of the um, the build phase for this admin app is basically 
uh, wrapped up in grunt tasks instead of the Rails asset pipeline. Um, and we've taken compilation and reduced it, you know, by an order of magnitude from what the Rails asset pipeline did, just because Node and Grunt are significantly faster at file I/O. So these are just some stats about kind of the size of, of this application. There's about 500 copy script files in the main source tree. Um, you know, 76 SCSS files, about 450 HTML templates, and then there are about 80,000 customers who host their um, their stores on Shopify and use this admin interface on, on a daily basis. And we were talking before the, the live broadcast started about how many deploys happen of this app uh, per day, and I'd say probably uh, 100 to, you know, on some days maybe 150 to 200 deploys can happen in any given day. So let's just look briefly at what we're going to talk about um, in this uh, webcast, you know, talking about this idea of a modern workflow and how we can bring um, um, modernized ideas and thinking to um, front-end web development. We're, we'll take a look at a tiny little sample app, uh, and then we'll dig into some specifics on Grunt and Lineman uh, that we can work with. Um, so let's dig in. When you think of uh, traditional web apps, um, this uh, you know is kind of uh, intended to represent that. You look at all of the concerns that are sort of wrapped up in traditional web app application frameworks, templating, um, they often have opinions about how to manage client-side assets as well as MVC architectures for um, server-side routes that, that they're handling and then sort of traditional server-side concerns like authentication and security and storage. And that front-end piece is really the, the part that we want to talk about in this webcast um, uh, and understanding that oftentimes as you're moving between um, application architectures uh, on the back end, so for example if you're working in .NET, a .NET stack would have particular opinions about how it manages its server-side code, but also um, how it manages its client-side code. And then if you move to Ruby on Rails, those conventions about how to manage client-side code would be vastly different from .NET. Um, and so that's why I kind of classify this traditional web app approach as heavy. It's got a lot of concerns mixed into the, the, the burden that the framework has to bear. And so if we take a look at what a, a sort of a smart or a modern web app application looks like, I think you're going to see that more and more this type of application architecture is um, being made possible where, you know, on the left we've got the engineer and he represents the front end concerns, templating, um, how to compile static assets like CSS and HTML and JavaScript. Uh, and then MV star, sort of model view and maybe not controller, maybe presenter, but some sort of framework uh, that you're going to use to build this rich web application on the front end. Uh, and then that communicates via XML HTTP request um, and sort of, uh, you know, uses these modern platform um, browsers as the deployment target for uh, that application. And then communicating with the server happens via JSON. You know, JSON APIs are very light. You know, you can, some people do this with XML, but I think um, more and more we're seeing people do this with JSON, and it's sort of standardized to become the communication medium for these types of apps. And so now our back end is, is not so concerned with these front-end um, asset management concerns or even application management concerns. And so the people on the front-end are happier because they can manage all the things that matter on server-side application development, authentication, security, and storage, things that um, need to happen on the back-end. And I think all of this uh, has been made possible by sort of advancements in HTML5 uh, in the platform that we're seeing browser vendors really push forward um, really rich features like local storage and session storage, um, web workers, uh, the stuff that's coming in ECMAScript 6, like object.observe. There's just all of these rich API features that are coming from the platform itself that have really given rise to, to being able to do this. And so, you know, there's been frameworks that have come out that have sort of enabled the modern web app approach where you're looking at building things in Backbone or Ember or Angular, um, and we've got this modern platform that we can leverage and that even more now we're, we're starting to be able to, to do advanced things within the browser. Um, but I think the thing that's really been lacking has been modern tooling. That's that last checkbox there. And so if we look at, again, traditional tooling, um, this is kind of what I alluded to earlier. You, you've got the stacks on the right uh, where they all have their opinions about how to manage um, their server-side code, which makes sense, but then they all have differing opinions on how to manage front-end assets. Uh, and, you know, these concerns are really um, how to compile, how to concatenate and minify those assets, 
how to manage templating, um, what about analysis and testing, you know, if you're coming from a Java world, you're going to probably use something like Sonar to do static analysis on your Java code, um, and then you might use something like JUnit to, to do test-driven development. And then this idea of modules, how do I split my code into sort of separate logical buckets, and all of those problems have been very well solved on the server side, uh, but when it comes to client-side code, they're, they're sort of treated as a second-class citizen. Uh, and I think it's just because up until recently, the tooling hasn't been there to support um, promoting client-side development to a first-class citizen. So if we jump to a modern tooling approach, I think it makes sense for all of those concerns um, that we listed on the previous slide to be split amongst uh, sort of a front-end workflow and a, and a server-side workflow. So the, the client can have its own workflow that manages concatenation and integration, um, optimization, how to manage testing, how to manage templates, minification. Um, and the server-side can also sort of have its own workflow for things. And I think that that separation is a logical separation um, because the concerns of managing those are different when you're dealing with client-side and server-side code. Uh, and so that's kind of what we're going to take a look at um, as we dive into the code. And that's as many slides as I uh, have to go through um, in that section there. So if there's no questions, we're going to jump into basically working through code. And if you want to follow along uh, with um, the code examples here, uh, you can go to this GitHub repo on... Uh, on front-end well, grunt workflow. The branch that we're going to be working through is actually not master. It's called PDC. I, I reduced the number of commits that we're going to walk through. So if you switch to that branch and then click on um, commits, if you don't want to check it out, you can sort of use the web app to follow along with uh, what we're going to be doing. And I've basically preceded the commit log with um, notes sort of about each step along the way. Uh, that you can sort of walk through this on, at your leisure later and, and take a view. Um, this was used as part of a larger one-day workshop that I do on, on Grunt um, and Lineman and sort of walking through it in more detail. We're going to kind of blaze through it in, you know, an hour and a bit uh, to try and cover as much as possible. But um, if you want to go through it later, you can walk through that commit history. So I have the project checked out here. Um, I just have it checked out in Code Workshop. And uh, I'm on a particular commit. I actually started at the starting point SHA, and I just checked that out with Git. Um, so what we're going to do is kind of crawl through the history and take a look at the state of the, the app uh, that we're going to be walking through uh, and sort of look at different pieces of sort of building up this workflow with Grunt um, from purely static files into more of uh, an application management lifecycle for front end. So if we take a look here, we can see that we're at the starting point. I'm going to show you what the app looks like. Um, if I list out the directory listing, you can see that all we have to start are purely static files. There's an index HTML. Um, some images for this app, style sheets, and a JavaScript folder with the actual app code, uh, and then a vendor folder with our, our vendor dependencies. So let's take a look at what that looks like. This is what the app looks like here. Uh, it is a small, sort of self-contained, single-page web app that's built with um, AngularJS, and, uh, and later through the, the process, I actually flipped it into Backbone.js just to short, so, sort of show that this... Um, this idea of first-class workflow for front-end doesn't necessarily have to be coupled to your application framework. Um, it can be completely decoupled, which is kind of what we want. This is for a game called the Banner Saga Factions, and it's basically a loadout um, organizer, and you can actually go through and sort of swap these guys around and click on them and tweak their stats, and it's doubly bound, um, so you can kind of see things updating in real time there and I can hit Done Editing and hide it. And that's basically the scope of the app. There's enough complexity in it that I think it's a good example of uh, how we can craft a workflow for it. Um, if you look at previous sort of talks on this, there's a lot of people that will start at a very simple example, like a to-do app. And I don't think it provides enough complexity in setup 
uh, to really understand what all the pieces are that make up a good front-end workflow. So I'm going to come back to the terminal here, and I'm just going to do a tree um, to show sort of what the, the output of this um, directory structure is so you can kind of see the files. So we've got our CSS file again, our CSS folder again, um, images, which are all of the character images for this app, and with ranks, and then some icons. Uh, that one index HTML, uh, our JavaScript folder, with a bunch of um, sort of folders to, to showcase how to structure this uh, AngularJS application. Uh, and then our vendor dependencies. Uh, we're pulling in Angular and jQuery and a couple of other libraries that you may use uh, in client-side development. And so if we think about um, how this is sort of structured, if we open up the, uh, let's open it up here. I'm just going to make sure I make my font nice and big so you guys can see it. Is that pretty readable? Uh, well, that might be too big. <laughs> too big. I'll so shrink it down a bit. Small. How's that? Is that that's good? good? Yeah, that's good. Awesome. Um, so, you know, if we look at the index HTML as sort of our deployment artifact that's, that's sort of being deployed in the browser, we can see that we've got our list of vendor dependencies, we've got our list of app dependencies, is just JavaScript includes. And this, as a sort of dependency management strategy, has really worked for as long as the web has been around, right? The, the order that I include these files in uh, implies my dependency management strategy. I need those vendor dependencies to load before my app dependencies load so that um, they're loaded into the browser's memory so that things can work in the right order. Um, and this works for sort of a certain class of maybe not application, but sort of just websites if we think about uh, simple websites where we're going to sprinkle some JavaScript. But when we talk about the idea of building a single page application or a rich client application, um, this falls down pretty fast. And so we're going to start by transforming um, this into a workflow where we can avoid having to you know, come into this HTML file and add JavaScript includes uh, in order to manage dependencies. So let's go back to the terminal here. And we're going to just go to the next commit. And now our directory structure is going to have a, a few more files. In particular, uh, we've got this package JSON file that's shown up. Uh, this is basically uh, like a dependency manifest um, that's going to enumerate the things that we need uh, to install from Node.js in order to work with our uh, workflow. I'll just point out a couple other things. You'll notice that there's this steps markdown file. And as I crafted this commit history to sort of walk through, uh, I also enumerated all of the steps that are in there. Uh, so if we cat that out, you can see that um, all of the steps up to this point in the commit history uh, are, are there as sort of commands that you'll need to execute to get to this point. Um, and that's intended to just show uh, kind of the, the flow that happens when you're working with, um, with NPM and with Node. So let's look at package JSON. You can see that it's very simple. It's got some metadata about the project. Um, but the piece that we're interested in to sort of start our grunt workflow is this dependencies hash. And we're listing grunt as a dependency and then a grunt contrib concat plugin. Um, and concat is the first plugin that we're going to work with. Uh, so in order to um, get this up and running, I'm going to need to do a couple things. The first one is npm install. Um, which will sort of interrogate that package JSON file and pull in the dependencies into a local folder called node modules. And this is basically um, sort of all you need to know to get started with managing dependencies with NPM. You enumerate them in the package JSON and you call NPM install in order to install those dependencies. So when you're thinking about deploying and sort of uh, managing this stuff from a code repository point of view, you wouldn't check in node modules. Um, you would probably just check in your package JSON and your automated build step would uh, NPM install during deployment, which is what we do at Shopify. The other file that you'll notice that we had um, is something called a grunt file.js. And if we take a look at this, I'll actually open it in the editor. You can see that it's basically just JavaScript. Um, Node's module system uses something called exports, which is a common JS module. 
And on line one there, you can see that we are exporting uh, a single function that takes the grunt runtime as its argument. And this is basically this, the pattern that all of the, the grunt um, configuration, the grunt file, uh, will follow. Uh, the grunt file is basically the entry point um, at which the grunt, grunt runtime will uh, inject itself and try to configure itself. And the, the grunt file is basically a configuration for what tasks are going to run and which files are going to be um, used as part of that task run. So you can see here that I've created my config on line four, and the line five has a task target. Um, this is a named task target that maps to a specific task. Uh, if you see down here on line 33, uh, we've actually loaded that task from an external source, which is in node modules here. Let's see if I can zoom in. So you can see uh, node modules showing up in grunt contrib concat, and there's a tasks folder in there. And so when I say grunt uh, dot load npm tasks, that's where it's pulling that from. So the config file breaks down. Let's configure the task. Uh, let's provide a configuration target at the top level, um, the task config, and then a target. And some grunt tasks can run on multiple targets. And in this case, I've just called it an app target. Uh, and then you can also configure um, destination and source mapping. So in this case, we want to concatenate all of those files that were in our HTML file into a single minified bundle, um, which I'm going to stick inside of this folder generated. Uh, if you think about other um, build tools, they often have a spot where they will put compiled artifacts. Uh, and in this case, we're going to stick them in this generated folder that will be ignored in our git ignore file so that it wouldn't be committed to, uh, to git or to a version control system. And so now, we're enumerating all of these dependencies in this source. And Grunt allows us to enumerate those as an array, a JavaScript array. Uh, and it also allows us to do a couple other things. You'll see here on line 14, we can use file globbing so that we don't have to enumerate all of those dependencies, only the ones that matter to the load order of our application. Um, so that kind of reduces the amount of noise. And if we look in our index HTML now, you can see that we're just referencing that compiled artifact, the single generated. Um, file. And so the way that we <coughs> work with that, oh, I'm just going to disable that. The way that we work with that is by telling Grunt, here's my config. Um, I want to initialize it on line 27. And then uh, I want to register a workflow. So in this case, default, um, which is just a list of tasks, concat is the only task that we have in our our list of, of workflows. And the way that we interact with that from the command line uh, is using something called grunt CLI, which is a node module that you would install globally. So the command that I would uh, use to install that is npm install grunt CLI um, dash G, and then I would hit return. I've already got it installed. And this basically installs uh, that into the, lo the global node module space, and then also links it to user local bin so that you have an executable from the command line. Uh, and the result of that is that I can now type grunt, and I get the, the output here. So you'll see that uh, it sort of gives me some logging about what was run. Um, I've run that concat task and the app target. Um, you can see that separated by the colon. And then we've generated that generated JS app min JS. Uh, and so now if I open up um, my app and I reload it, you can see that everything still works. I can go in and edit and things like that. Um, but if we look at the head here, uh, you can see that I've, I'm only serving up a single file. Um, this you know, stage of our workflow isn't too helpful because every time we make a change, we're going to have to come in here and run grunt in order to get that new generated um, bundle. But we, luckily, grunt includes some other tasks that we can work with to automate these sort of steps. So let's go to the next one and take a look at the commit history. Um, in this one, I basically changed the grunt file from JavaScript to CoffeeScript. Uh, if you aren't familiar with CoffeeScript, it is a language that transpiles into JavaScript, um, but it uh, is optimal in some ways for a configuration file format because it removes some of the noise uh, that we had in the JavaScript file. I'm just going to go back one step and then open up that JavaScript file so you can kind of compare. 
So here's the JavaScript on the right um, and the CoffeeScript on the left. Let's get rid of... Uh, oh, that's the wrong file, isn't it? I was opening the grunt contrib and cat grunt file. There we go. That's our grunt file. So now we got a, an apples to apples comparison. So we shaved off a few lines, but the nice thing about CoffeeScript is we don't have to use um, braces or commas. They're optional, um, and semicolons as well. Uh, parentheses are also optional for function invocation. Um, and so there's, you know, an argument to be made that, well, this is adding an additional step, but luckily um, Grunt just handles this sort of uh, transpilation transpar transparently, so we don't have to think about it. And we can um, craft our config files using just a little bit less noise. So this is the, uh, the format that I prefer. And if we go back and go next, and we run Grunt, um, you can see that regardless of whether it was CoffeeScript or JavaScript, our workflow still works. So that's just a, a minor point about CoffeeScript. Um, let's go to the next one and take a look at what changed here. Um, and so you can see that the git diff shows that we added a new entry to our Grunt configuration. We added a watch task. And what watch does is provides a way to listen for changes on a particular file set um, within the config and then execute tasks when any of those files change on disk. So in this case, we want to listen to changes on any of the files that are in the concat tasks app targets source key. Uh, and this is a feature of Grunt that's really nice. Uh, you can reference um, areas in the config sort of uh, without having to store those off in another variable. These template strings are interpolated at runtime and expanded recursively uh, so that you don't you can just reference areas of the config keys uh, without having to, to save those off. In this case, we want to listen to any of those files that have changed and then rerun that concat task if that happens. And again, we need to tell Grunt that it needs to load that task from an NPM plugin, in this case, Grunt Contrib Watch. Uh, and then we've added it to our workflow, um, the default task, uh, which runs by default if you just type Grunt at the command line. So in this case, we want to run concat first and then watch. Um, and then there's some application level changes that I won't dig into too much. They're Angular specific. Uh, so now if we run npm install, we've got to pull in our new plugin, Grunt Contrib Watch. And if we run Grunt, you can see that Concat app ran first uh, in our task lifecycle, and then the watch task sits. And it's a task that never exits basically until the process exits. Um, so if I make my terminal over here, and I pull in one of those files, for example, app.js, and I make some file changes to it, and I hit save, you can see that the watch task detected the change, it's logged out that change, and then it's rerun my concat task automatically. So this brings sort of the first level of automation to um, our workflow. And there's a number of other pieces that we're going to add to this uh, as we continue that sort of build this up so that we as developers basically have to do less and less to sort of remember um, the steps that we would normally do if we were just working with static assets uh, in a purely static environment. The more we can automate, the better in this case. So that's watch. Let's go next. And we'll take a look at this commit. This pulls in Grunt Contrib less, which is a style sheet preprocessor. And one of the sort of recommendations that I give to companies that I've consulted with on this sort of thing is um, using a style sheet preprocessor can save you uh, and your designers a lot of work. Um, this is becoming less of an issue as browsers are embracing um, non-prefixed style sheet properties. Uh, but you know when designers had to work with adding specific style rules for each browser, it was more of an issue where you had to prefix for WebKit, you had to prefix for um, Microsoft or Firefox with the dash moz, dash ms, and dash WebKit properties. Uh, and so a style sheet preprocessor lets you you know abstract away that and automate some things and also do some other things. So in this case, our uh, grunt file has changed. We've added the less task um, configuration and a dev target to say that we want to map um, the results of CSS slash style dot less, that is the source, into the destination. And this is another way that you can uh, enumerate 
um, destination and source mappings in Grunt, where the destination is a key in a JSON um, object or JavaScript object literal, and the source is the value. Uh, again, we've loaded it from npm, so we're going to need to npm install it. So I'll just do that really quickly and pull it in. And it's going to pull in a bunch of child dependencies, which you can kind of see enumerated at the bottom there. Uh, and if we look in, I'm just going to close these other ones. CSS now we have a less file. Um, less is one of the popular style sheet preprocessor formats. SAS or SCSS would be the other sort of popular one. Uh, and this allows us to do a couple of things. We've got mix-ins. Um, here's a mix-in that does a gradient generation for the background. Uh, here's a box shadow mix-in that abstracts away cross-browser differences and emits uh, the, the differences for us in the compiled CSS. Um, and then there's a couple other things that we're doing in this file that I want to highlight. The, the key one being um, inlining the results of our images as base64 encoded data URIs. Uh, this is sort of a, an automation step that would be non-trivial to implement if you were doing it by hand. You know, you'd have to convert each of these images to base64 encoded strings, generate the data URI, and then generate your style sheet and inline it. And so by using a preprocessor, we can automate that step. So let's see what it looks like in our workflow. Um, you can see that there's a bunch more output in the terminal. Uh, in this case, um, Grunt Contrib less warns us when those images are larger than what is safe to embed as a base64 encoded image in our application. And you might be wondering, well, why would I want to embed my image as a base64 encoded string? Uh, there's a couple of benefits. One, uh, you avoid an additional HTTP request whenever uh, your style sheet is loaded and whenever your application is loaded, um, because typically for every image attribute and every source, uh, image tag and every source attribute that you have, you'll incur an additional HTTP request. Uh, so this is one way to get around that. It's traditionally more appropriate for smaller images, like icons. And it also allows you to get away from using icon sprites, um, which have maintenance overhead in that you have to manage x and y coordinate offsets when you're creating the sprites. So let's reload our application and take a look at um, what sort of implications this has. Uh, if we use the WebKit um, Chrome DevTools and inspect one of these images now, uh, you can see that the background image property is this big giant string that's been inlined as um, this is what a data URI does basically. Uh, so it's qualified the MIME type at the beginning there, data, image, PNG, um, it's base64 encoded, and then the actual data that's come through here. Uh, if we jump over to the sources tab, and make this a little bit bigger, sorry, the network tab, um, and you can see that uh, the result of this is that we don't have subsequent HTTP requests for those images, but our style sheet has ballooned to 5.7 megabytes, which is definitely not optimal when you're creating a web application. So um, the point of this was just to show you how to get the automation and not necessarily to um, you know, uh, point out that the, the images are larger. In this case, I would not deploy this to production uh, in this state because uh, these are images that are not icons. They're full of a lot more detail, and therefore they're really not appropriate to base64 encode. Um, probably m something like uh, these icons down here, um, the shield and these guys that are more less likely to change and smaller that would be more appropriate to inline. Um, but again, the point was just to show you how to get the automation running. Um, I'll take a look a little bit later about some optimization that we can do uh, to automate uh, fixing that stuff. Let's go to the next one. Uh, what do we do here? Right, so we added less to our workflow, but we didn't add um, a watch target for it. And so in this case, I've modified the grunt config uh, to rename that watch target from app, which didn't seem uh, appropriate to me. Again, these are target names that you can um, sort of give semantic meaning to. So in this case, I've renamed it to JS. Uh, and then I've also added one for less, so that whenever those less files change uh, that are enumerated in the config, uh, it will rerun the less task dev target to recompile less files. Uh, so I'm not going to demo that, because um, we already saw how watch is working. Let's jump to the next one. Right, in this one, uh, I actually sort of started to slice up the config file because one of the things I've found as I've been building um, apps with Grunt 
and sort of generating this config is that the concern of the task configuration and what files the tasks will run on, um, it's often helpful to separate those. And so the net result is this files object, um, which sort of showcases another feature of grunt configuration. You can add arbitrary keys that you want to the config and then use those um, to reference. In this case, I've added a files key, and then I've started sort of um, creating buckets for all of the files that I want to manage. So in this case, we've got a less key under files, uh, which has a source attribute, and then similarly a JS key, and then all of those um, source dependencies enumerated. Uh, and the benefit here is that we get a nice clean separation, and now our tasks um, targets can basically reference those in files. These are the files that this task is going to use, and it's much easier to, at a glance, see what the configuration for each task is going to do without having to sort of parse through a list of files. So if we jump back here, we can see uh, how that works. Here's my files key, and then here's my task configuration targets below. So it's a lot cleaner to, to um, view this. Let's jump to the next one. Uh, this one is basically uh, setting up the workflow so that we can start to mirror what our production environment is going to be like in development um, without some overhead. Uh, in this case, I've added grunt contrib copy so that I can move that index HTML over to the generated folder. Uh, and then in the next step, we're going to actually create a static web server that, so that we can kind of mimic what our production environment is going to be like. So let's do next. And this is the um, place where we add a custom task. Uh, so again, we're in the grunt file, we've added a key, a, a task uh, of server, and we've added some properties, the base where we want to serve this static web server out of, which is our generated directory, uh, and then what port we want to kick off that development server on, which is port 8000. And if we go and look inside of um, the root here and look in tasks, you can see that, uh, let me just zoom in, see if I can get that. Uh, inside of tasks, there's this server um, file. And this is a purely a custom task. So Grunt allows you to pull in tasks from uh, the community, from NPM, uh, that are NPM modules. Uh, anything that starts with grunt-contrib is a community module that has sort of been curated. Uh, it's guaranteed to have tests. It's probably of high quality. Um, but you can also publish and write your own tasks. So in this case, I chose to write my own task um, pulling in a popular node-based static um, web server called Express. Uh, and there's a couple of things I'd just like to highlight. Again, we're um, exporting a function that injects the grunt runtime. Uh, we can require Express, uh, which is enumerated now in our package JSON. Um, and we can... Uh, oops, let me get back there. Um, to create a task, you call grunt.registerTask. Uh, the first argument is the name of the task, which also maps to the configuration key and a description of what the task does when it runs. Uh, and then we're grabbing those configuration attributes that we set in the config. So this key path, uh, server.web.port, maps to um, the key path in our uh, configuration file here, server.web.port. So we can inject configurations. We can also provide defaults. In this case, I've already provided port 8000. Uh, but if the user didn't provide that in their grunt config for this task, uh, we would just default it to 8000. Um, and then serve out of uh, whatever base they provide, otherwise the, the distributable area. Uh, then we tell uh, Express that it needs to use its static um, file handling middleware and its error handling middleware, and then just listen on the web port. So let's give that a shot. We're probably going to have to npm install to pull in dependencies. And let me install Express, because I know that that's the one that I need. So at this point, we're, we're sort of making our workflow mimic more what our production environment is going to be like. So now our image inlining ran in the data URI for less task, our concat task ran. We copied over that HTML file to our generated folder. Now we're starting to serve that out of generated. So let's open that up. Uh, so instead of accessing this on the file protocol, uh, I can close this and go to localhost 8000. Uh, and now I have the app running sort of in a static web server. Let's go next. 
This is a really fast one. Um, one of the things that I firmly believe is that uh, the development experience should not be compromised um, just because uh, we can't do things like minify or gzip or things like that. And so in my server task, I added express.compress middleware so that when I'm running, um, the development experience is sort of even closer to production without the performance overhead. Actually, it's a, it's a performance boost to add gzip. Uh, if we go to the network tab and reload, you can see now that in the headers, for content encoding, uh, I've actually got gzip working here. Uh, and this uh, also gives me an indication of what um, my payloads are going to be like in production, or at least a little bit closer. So that 5.7 meg style sheet with all of our inline images is now 4.3 megabytes gzipped and compressed. Uh, and you know this wasn't hard to do. We just added that one middleware to our development environment. Uh, and it gives developers sort of an indication of what are the characteristics of these files going to be like in production without having to go through the step of doing a production build. And I think that that's really valuable. You can see that the app.min.js was squished from uh, 818 kilobytes down to 213 kilobytes. And if you're wondering, sort of as a rule of thumb, gzip typically for JavaScript files will reduce by 75%. So you can kind of see that here, um, those characteristics. Let's go next. I'm going to skip that one. This one, if you want to check it out later, it was basically adding live reload functionality, um, which uh, will automatically reload the web page when somebody makes a change to a file. Let me see if I can demo it really quickly. We didn't have to add any dependencies, so now if I run grunt, um, we've got the watch task going. Let's take a look at the configuration so you can see what changed. Um, so we had that watch key for Grunt Contrib Watch. The only option we added here was Live Reload True. And what that does is it spins up uh, a Live Reload server uh, on a specific port, uh, and then you can add a Chrome extension, um, which is right up here in the corner. Uh, there we go. And if I reload the page and I enable that guy, um, you can see it's really hard to see, but uh, you can see your Live Reload is connected if I mouse over that. And now, uh, if I change one of these assets, for example, that app.js, you know, I've got all the goodness of my watch stuff running, so if I add an alert and say this, uh, and then my browser automatically reloaded. I didn't hit command R there. So that enables a couple of different workflows for primarily designers. Um, they're the ones that really enjoy the live reload functionality, uh, especially if they're modifying style sheets and changing colors or things like that. Then they don't have to hit command R, and you get this really nice feedback loop um, for developing front-end code. So that's something you can add uh, just in Grand Contrib Watch. You just flip on that live reload option and install the Chrome plugin so that it's opt-in for your users. And if designers want to do that workflow, they can, and developers don't have to. Uh, and the reason that's important is because I think uh, when you're building a, tr a rich client application, um, you don't necessarily want to have all that state that's in the page lost uh, every time you make a file change. So I think um, the Chrome extension is a good way to make that opt-in. And so in this, ta in this uh, commit, I think I just added a clean command. Um, as we we're generating targets or generating artifacts into these targets for distribution and, and the generated folder, sometimes uh, it becomes helpful to be able to just clean the state of that. Uh, and this sort of introduces how you can execute um, any arbitrary task that you want from the grunt command line. So now we can run grunt clean uh, after we npm install it. And now we can run grunt clean. Uh, and it'll clean out those those folders for us. And sometimes it's helpful to get back to a clean state. So that's something. That's a, a way that you can do that. Let's go next. I'm gonna skip that one. I'm gonna skip that one as well. Right. This is probably one of the last ones I'm gonna show in this um, area. And basically what I've done is added a, another module called Grunt Contrib Uglify. And Uglify takes JavaScript files and compresses them, does minification on them. And this is sort of a step that you want to add to your workflow uh, as you're getting ready to produce production assets, production ready assets. So we've added some metadata, which is a, just a, a banner um, that consumes some information from that package JSON file. And that banner is going to be emitted at the top of all of our uh, compiled artifacts, in this case, the JavaScript files, which you can see that we've configured in the uglify task um, by providing the banner as an option key. 
And then we've created this dist uh, target. That's just, um, there's no convention around that. This is just what I decided to call it. Um, the source and the desk keys, again, um, will consume the results of the concatenation step and then emit it in uh, a distributable artifact, which is the minified JavaScript. So let's npm install to pull in grunt contrib uglify. And I think while that's running, I can show you the, how the config changed. Uh, so again, we're sort of building up our workflow of tasks by adding these NPM plugins. Um, and then if you see at the bottom here, I'm going to make it really big so that we can see. Um, I've got my default task, which is sort of intended to mirror development workflow. And then I've got one for production, which I've called build. Uh, and you can call these uh, sort of aliases or lists of tasks, whatever you want. Um, and now if I run grunt build from the command line, uh, I've got my production workflow, and it's running all those other tasks, and then the last thing it does is uglify the distributable, and then copies those things into that distributable folder. So if we look in there, you can see that now I've got um, my production-ready assets. And this is basically, uh, you know, as far as I want to go with the grunt showcase, because I wanted to show you guys uh, some of Lineman, which adds some convention and wrapping around um, grunt and a number of other tools. So let's do that. So Lineman is you know, another command line utility that you get by installing globally. And it's intended to um, take a lot of the configuration management out of uh, a developer's um, responsibility, uh, similar to how Ruby on Rails really um, provided a lot of convention for developing web applications. Um, on the server side with MVC conventions. Lineman is intended to be used uh, with any front-end framework that you want. It's agnostic, um, but uh, it also provides some lifecycle um, opinions and a couple of other commands that we'll take a look at here. So the first way that you can get Lineman is uh, installing it globally like we did with Grunt CLI, so npm install-g Lineman. And once you do that, uh, you will have Lineman on your command line. Um, and you can take a look at help. Uh, that's one way you can work with it. Um, so you'll see here that, I'm just going to shrink this so it fits in the window. There we go. Uh, you can see that new is a command that we can issue to sort of scaffold out a, a project. And new is the only scaffold that Lineman includes, and it's very, very um, bare bones. So let's do that. Let's go to code, um, and let's do Lineman new um, DevOps live. And you can see that we've got some fancy ASCII art, and it gave us a uh, generated project scaffold in um, code slash DevOps Live, and some instructions about the uh, commands that a user can execute. So run will get us kicked off with the development workflow, lineman run, lineman build will build the distributable, clean to get rid of those um, generated artifacts that we were looking at in the grunt workflow, uh, and then spec to run unit tests. Uh, lineman wraps a tool called testum, which automatically is configured to consume the output of lineman run uh, and automatically rerun your tests on file change. So I'll show you what that looks like. So now I'll cd into that directory that I created and do lineman run. Um, and that kicks off a whole bunch of tasks. Lineman comes pre-configured with a bunch of sort of common tasks that you would use when you were working with uh, a rich client app development paradigm. So concatenation, automatically compiling copy script, um, taking care of web fonts and um, marshalling uh, different pages into that generated folder and then kicking off that development server. So if we go to localhost 8000, um, nothing much here. Uh, we've got a couple of things that I can showcase. Uh, we are pre-compiling templates, underscore templates in this case, into uh, a namespace on the window object, JST. Uh, so if I execute that guy, app templates, hello. You can see that it's just a function, and I think I need to provide a text key. Text. And then that generates us our uh, HTML fragment. Uh, these are sort of the building blocks that you're going to want when you're building a rich web application. And so we've basically crafted all of the, um, the pieces that you need to get started out of the box. Um, framework agnostic, this is not using any particular framework to do this. Uh, let's just take a look at the um, code so you can see the, I'll do it with the tree actually. 
Uh, so again, there's our grunt file in the lineman scaffold that was generated. And then we have this app folder, which is um, kind of analogous to the Ruby on Rails app folder, uh, except it's all oriented at client-side assets. So we've got our style sheets. Um, any images can go in here. JavaScript or CoffeeScript can go in the JS file. Um, pages are basically uh, HTML templates that you either want to pre-process or they can just be standard HTML files. Uh, and then templates, which get marshaled into that JST object, uh, at least in the vanilla template here. Uh, configuration mirrors sort of the Rails configuration uh, folder structure. And that separation that we talked about in the grunt workflow, um, we've got uh, application-level task configs inside of application.js, and then which files are being operated on inside of files.js. Uh, server configures the development server, uh, and then spec configures how our test runner is set up, and that's all pre-configured for you. We'll take a look at a couple of those individually. Um, here's that generated folder, which is our uh, development artifacts. Uh, there's that package JSON, which has the metadata for all of the plugins that we're going to be installing. Uh, here's our spec folder, which comes preceded with some helpers and a very simple um, hello spec to sort sort of give you the hello world on how to set up testing. Um, Tasks is sort of a grunt convention. You can have a tasks folder where you create custom tasks if you want. You can extend Lineman's um, workflow by adding to that tasks directory and then configuring them. And then in this case, our vendor dependencies, whether they're style sheets, uh, images, or JavaScript. Um, so that is sort of the basic folder structure that you get with any Lineman project. So let's look at testing. So I've got my development workflow such that um, you know I, I'm, I've got the watcher running and it's waiting and listening for changes. It's going to recompile all my assets. What about testing? Let's run a lineman spec in another terminal while lineman run is running. And this is going to kick off something called testum. So you can see that we got an automatic launch of Chrome uh, and it started to run our tests for us. In this case, it's a really simple test. Make that a little bit bigger. Um, just to verify some of the dynamic behavior. One of the common problems I've seen in server-side frameworks is that setting up JavaScript testing is non-trivial. And so Lineman was really built to sort of take all of these configuration concerns that you don't want to think about when you want to just spin up a new app or even experiment. Um, and it's, it's sort of set it up for you. And Testum is really great uh, because you can configure it to actually launch any um, browsers that you have on your operating system. So if we go into that config folder and look at spec.json, you can see that uh, launch in dev is set up to launch Chrome. But if I wanted it to launch Firefox, I can just add that here, save it. Let's kill test them. And let's run it again with lineman spec. And now we've got Chrome and Firefox running our tests. And the cool thing is that um, Lineman integrates the workflow such that whenever a file changes in um, the grunt config, it will reload and recompile that. And Testum is set to also listen for those changes and re-execute tests uh, when any of those files change. So if I open up, uh, in this case, the only app file that we have, which is that hello.coffee, and I change this to say um, hello DevOps live. And I hit save. Now you can see that instantly my um, files were recompiled and my tests reran in all of the agents that were connected. Uh, and the the really cool thing about developing um, JavaScript in this uh, in this way uh, and rich JavaScript applications is that when you get a workflow like this established where you've automated all these steps, your feedback loop becomes so small um, that development becomes super enjoyable, and you've got uh, you know a really fast feedback loop, and you can see um, things running super fast on every change. Uh, and people are probably wondering, well, how does this scale to a more complex application? I've built applications using Lineman with both Backbone and Angular, um, in some cases that have as many as 3,000 unit tests running, uh, and they usually complete in less than a second. Um, and JavaScript uh, tooling has gotten to the point now where if you're writing your tests appropriately, uh, and not um, crossing too many boundaries in your unit tests. For example, you wouldn't ever want to go out over the wire in the browser or things like that. Uh, you can get this level of feedback um, and this tight uh, iteration loop. And so that's uh, one of the really nice things about Lineman that we've integrated. Um, and it's very easy to configure. All of the configuration attributes live in these you know, really simple spots inside of that config folder. I'll just show you kind of what the, the overview of those looks like. Um, here's what you get out of the box with application.js. 
Uh, it's got some comments just for things that are different from uh, Lineman's workflow. Uh, and it does have some other features um, that you can add. Uh, and API proxying is one of them. And I'll show you a little bit of that in our uh, Angular template. But by default, um, the config is very lean in here. I mean, there's nothing in here, and that's by design. It's, it's intended to be extended um, with sort of the overrides that you want to make to Lineman's default configuration, which we can take a look at if you want to uh, check. If you go into the documentation, uh, we can look down here. So these are the um, lifecycle phases that run in Lineman's default configuration. Um, there's a common phase that runs tasks uh, intended to be run in both development and when you're running a production build. Um, there's the development set of tasks that only run in development, and then there's your distribu uh, distribution tasks, so things that run when you do lineman build. Um, and those are all sort of pre-configured for you, uh, and you can extend those by overriding the config, and there's some documentation on, on that here as well. So that's sort of the workflow that you get with Lyman out of the box. You don't have to think a lot about your config. It's set up for you. You can sort of scaffold and get running. Uh, but what if you want to build an application with uh, a specific MVC framework on the front end? We've got project templates for pretty much all of the popular frameworks. Um, if you've heard of something called Yeoman, it's a project from the guys at Google, and they've taken a code generation uh, approach to things. We don't uh, think CodeGen is the right approach um, because CodeGen, uh, code that's generated often goes out of um, date fast, especially if the framework that you're using is being updated constantly. So we just have static templates that you can clone. I'm going to show you the Lineman Angular template. You can grab all these templates on GitHub under Test Devils organization, uh, and there's one for Ember, Angular, Backbone, and a couple others that I'll showcase in a second. Uh, the Angular template is basically set up with the Lineman workflow, um, pre-configured for Angular. Oh, I think it's here. Yeah, there we go. Um, we've added some customizations to this to um, sort of tailor the workflow experience for uh, an Angular app development. And sort of all of our templates have basically done that. They've added task configurations that make sense for an Angular application. Um, but the interface that you um, interact with each of these templates is the same. You line run, run in development, you line run build to build your production ready assets, and you line run spec to test. So let's open this guy up now. Uh, it's really big. Um, and all of our templates are set up in a way that really help you kind of explore the base characteristics of each of these um, client-side MVC frameworks. So in this case, uh, this one is set up with a simple uh, Angular view where you can log in um, and actually see an XHR fire uh, to the backend API, um, which is being mocked out. I'll show you that in a second. Uh, and then, you know, kind of click around and interact, and you're able to explore the code in a way that gives you uh, enough of a, a sense of sort of what's happening and how you can use this to set up an app development lifecycle using these things. So the Backbone one is set up similarly, as well as the Ember one. Um, so how did, how did this XHR work? Let's take a look at the configuration for this guy. If we go into config, again, an application, uh, you can see that we've got a couple of extra things. Um, Lineman gives you a development server by default that allows you to enable HTML5 push state simulation. And if you're not familiar with push state, uh, it basically is what allows us to have pretty URLs in the browser um, without the hash. If you've seen other sort of app development frameworks, they've got that hash bang. Um, and that's how a lot of these client-side MVC frameworks tra track uh, state changes and then load fragments into the, into the DOM. Um, and it's often kind of clunky to, to work with in development. And Angular allows you to use push state, so does Backbone, so does Ember. And so we've sort of abstracted away the configuration so that you don't have to think about it. You just flip on push state, and then you can develop as if you had push state enabled for your production environment without having to worry about setting up Apache or things like that. Um, we've also extended uh, the list of default tasks that we're going to load from NPM, and you do that by adding to a simple array of NPM tasks to load. 
Um, we've also removed some tasks. So this is kind of how you interact with uh, Lineman's default configuration. Um, instead of sort of enumerating all of the keys in your configuration, uh, you remove tasks that you don't need, and you sort of shift things around in the lifecycle. In this case, uh, Angular has a couple of modules that we need, one for um, doing some minification pre-processing uh, of Angular files, and we want to prepend that to the distribution phase so that it runs first. Uh, and then we want to prepend um, a template preprocessor for Angular uh, into the common phase, so that ha that happens first. Uh, then we want to append a couple of tasks. Uh, one of the ones that we include in the Angular template is generation of source maps. Um, if you remember from the grunt workflow example, we were serving up a single minified bundle uh, in development, uh, and while that's great from a performance characteristic standpoint, it doesn't really make sense from a development and debugging standpoint. It's often very frustrating to debug in a single minified file, and source maps are the antidote for that. Uh, so if we take a look in the sources tab in Chrome DevTools, uh, you'll see that I've actually got all of the folders enumerated. Um, but I've only got one JavaScript file loaded. Let me reload this guy, and you can see that. So there's my single JavaScript file, and then you can see Chrome DevTools issued a request for the .map, uh, and this is a source map file. And a source map file includes all of the uh, original sources mapped so that DevTools can understand how to map back to those sources. Uh, and what this allows is I can actually open these particular um, files, even though they're not loaded uh, in, in the browser, and I've only got one HTTP request in development, but I can debug as if I had um, all of them included. So let's see if we can find a spot here that we can debug and reload. Uh, I think I'm missing my, there we go. So there, you can see I hooked into my debugger in the source mapped file. Um, so I can still get all the benefits of being able to debug in development, but I get the great performance characteristics in development that uh, you would get as if you were in a production environment. And I think this is important for a couple of reasons. One, uh, it sort of eliminates the overhead of uh, having to debug in a single minified file, so that makes the development experience better. And it also brings our development experience closer in line with what our production experience is. And I think that's especially important when dealing with client-side um, projects, uh, because in my experience, there have been numerous cases where the integration step of minification or things like that have actually introduced bugs in production. So my view is that the earlier we can integrate um, and make our development experience more like production without sacrificing uh, developer quality of life, um, the better off we'll be. So that's source maps. Uh, and then again, we've added you know, the grunt specific configuration for each of those tasks that we've added. So here's the template configuration. Uh, we're going to pre-process all of the templates inside of uh, app templates. So in this case, we have three HTML files, and we're going to stick them in Angular's template cache. Um, and this is, you know, you can do this on your own if you wanted to just use ng templates as part of an a vanilla grunt project. You could do that, um, but we've just provided these templates as sort of a, a base starting point. And a lot of people have found them useful to even just explore um, the different frameworks and see how a workflow works uh, with, you know, Angular or with Backbone or Ember or things like that. Again, this is just sort of the smaller set of configuration than you would need um, that is merged with the lineman defaults uh, that you get. Here's the concat source map tab task that is configured. And again, because we're using lineman, uh, while we're doing lineman run, we can go over and do lineman spec, and we've also got unit tests set up. So here's Chrome running uh, my minimal controller test, and this is an Angular, uh, using the Angular um, mocks framework and sort of Angular testing paradigms. Uh, so if you want, you can explore the spec folder and take a look at some of the specs that are there. This is one in JavaScript. Um, I think I've actually, yeah, I need to check out. Let's get back to master. Um, you can see that as I switched git branches there, all of the, um, the file watching detected everything and recompiled everything. I'm just going to do a clean because I switched branches to make sure that I don't have any leftover state. Uh, let's do a run again. And it's usually pretty snappy. It spins up right away. Node is very fast at file I.O., so a lot of the grunt tasks deal with file I.O., 
Uh, and it's been really nice to have that sort of instant test spin up. There we go. Now I have my nine tests. Um, and I've tried as best as I can in most of the templates. I wrote the Angular template. Uh, another guy at Test Double, Justin Searles, wrote the Ember one. And we've kind of collaborated on a bunch of the other ones. Um, but the idea being you know, that you get a, at least a cross-section of not only how to build an application with these frameworks, but also how to test them. And so you can see here I've got tests in both CoffeeScript and JavaScript that you can take a look at. The CoffeeScript ones are typically leaner because they have less uh, frowning mustaches and curly braces and semicolons. Um, and then we've also included our test helper um, setup that we like, which is using Jasmine. Uh, so we've got Jasmine Given, which is a variant of or inspired by our spec given. Justin Searles wrote this one. Uh, I wrote one called Jasmine Only, which allows you to uh, limit a spec run um, by using dot only in your test. So if I hit that, you can see there in the browser window that now um, it's detecting nine specs, but only one ran. So this is a, a quality of life thing. If you want to isolate to an individual spec run, you can do that with this, this helper. And again, this is you know stuff that's pre-configured for you in Lineman so that you don't have to think about it and you can kind of just get working. The last piece that I want to show, uh, talking about sort of unit test setup, is uh, the Angular team has done a really good job of providing an end-to-end -end test runner in something called Protractor. Uh, and the way that we enter that uh, is if we leave lineman run going, and in another tab, we spin up um, Selenium Server Standalone, which you can install. Uh, you just need the jar file, basically. So as long as you have Java installed on your path, um, and you can execute a jar file. And I'm going to spin up Selenium Server Standalone so that I can actually run uh, an end-to-end -end test where I spin up the browser and execute this um, thing standalone. And the reason I spin that up ahead of time in a separate tab is uh, Lineman is configured so that it can spin it up for you, but there's a tiny bit of overhead when you spin up uh, Selenium, and having that happen every time you execute a test is, is not optimal. So with that running, uh, in the Lineman Angular template, I can say Lineman Grunt. Um, spec E2E. And this will actually spin up the browser and execute tests, um, integration style tests against my actual app. So if I do that, uh oh. Selenium exited. Oh, you know what? I bet you I have to configure. Yeah, I do. Uh, let's go back here. This is a good point. So if you go into config and spec E2E.js, uh, this is where you configure your end to end specs. Uh, and in this case, I think my path is wrong to the jar because I upgraded to the later version of Selenium Server Standalone. So let's plug that in. It's 2.3 to 2.3.5. Uh, and I'm also running a server already. So I can tell Protractor about that here. Um, and I think we can do that. Now we should be good. Let's try it again. There we go. So it found that server. Uh, and it, it happened really fast, so I'll do it again so you can kind of see it. Um, but you'll see I got two tests passed and five assertions. And if I do it again, you'll see the browser pop up on the left. There it is. It ran through a couple of pages. It actually logged in against my API that I have running uh, and spun up the browser. So this is a really powerful way to get um, sort of integration testing or end-to-end -end testing. Uh, the Lineman Angular template is the only one that we have this um, pre-configured because uh, the Angular guys are the only ones really thinking hard about um, the problem of integration testing or sort of end-to-end -end testing. Uh, and they've put a lot of effort into Protractor, and so as a result, it was very easy to integrate this. Um, but the goal is that we would bring the same sort of end-to-end -end spec um, helper to all the other templates so that whether you're working with Backbone or Ember, you'd be able to get the same sort of experience. Um, we've, we're over time a little bit, but I have like two more things I wanted to show you. So, and then we'll get to some questions. Does that uh, sound good? Yeah, that sounds great. Okay. Um, so if we go back to the Lineman docs, when we go down to project templates, you'll see that we sort of got the MVC frameworks, um, but it turns out that Lineman and the workflow that it offers works really great for a number of other use cases that aren't even application development. Um, and we've got a template for developing libraries. 
Um, so you can actually use the lineman uh, sort of workflow paradigms and extensions by default and clone this template if you want to build a library. So the thing that I've found cool is I've, you know, as much as possible tried to um, look at lineman as a way uh, not only to build rich client applications but a workflow for developing just in general using client-side assets. Uh, so I've got one, let's see if I stuck it in here. Um, that Jasmine only plugin that I showed you actually. Uh, if we take a look at the, the tree, you'll see it's just a standard lineman um, project structure. And so there's a couple of things that this uh, reveals to me is that I can go to a project that uses this structure and instantly know that I can run lineman run to do development. And these tasks are again customized but to uh, to aid with the goal of producing a standalone library. In this case, the distributable is that JS file that people can download and include in their Jasmine tests to get that Jasmine only functionality. And then as I develop, uh, I can do lineman spec um, because I have unit tests that I want to run against this library. In this case, there's only five tests. Um, and you know, as I make changes, I'm producing this, uh, this workflow where I can get that rapid feedback iteration. And then when I'm ready to compile, you know, I just run lineman build. Uh, and I look inside of dist, and there's my artifacts ready for deployment. Uh, in this case, uh, those artifacts would be pushed up to GitHub, and I'd probably tag and cut a release for those, uh, and then maybe publish them uh, with a Bower module if I was using Bower to install dependencies or something like that. Uh, the other one I'll show you is actually, and the last one, is my blog. We've actually got a template called the Lyman blog template. Uh, which can compile markdown files and run your blog for you. So I converted my blog from Posteris after they got bought out by Twitter and then were shut down. Uh, and I don't use the test workflow for my blog because it doesn't have any tests. Um, but now I get sort of the same really fast spin-up time and I can generate my blog from markdown files. Uh, and the other cool thing is we've got a Heroku build pack. So if I make a change to my blog and I did a git push um, Heroku, uh, there's a Lineman Heroku build pack that's configured and it'll auto-deploy uh, and compile static assets and serve them up statically on Heroku. Uh, so you can use the Lineman build pack. Um, it's intended really for static um, websites. In this case, I don't have any changes, but uh, if I did, I could push that up to Heroku and deploy a new version of my um, blog just from the command line. So that's, you know, there's probably a ton of stuff in here and people will probably have uh, some questions, I'd love to answer them, but that is sort of my overview of both Grunt and then sort of Lineman, which is an extension on top of Grunt that wraps a couple of other tools and creates this, this workflow that you can use for front-end development. Do you guys have any questions? Cool. Do you, any of you guys have questions? First of all, I say that's amazing. I might have not have hated JavaScript as much as I do now if I had seen all that stuff back in the day. <laughs> I have a question about the, the mapping to the minified file. Is that kind of a, a common thing now, or how does that work in debugging? I'd yeah, so there's a couple things that come out of that that are relevant. One is um, it's, it's a discussion point for your organization whether you want mapped source maps to go up to production. Uh, a lot of people are using sort of the minification process as an obfuscation process, and if you have business logic in your JavaScript, people are concerned that uh, providing source maps is a way to sort of get a view into that for people. Um, there's a couple of things uh, to point out there. One is source maps are only ever loaded from uh, your web server if a user opens Chrome DevTools. So there's no performance overhead by adding that mapping file to your static web server. Uh, it's basically a developer improvement. Um, the second thing is uh, if you're treating obfuscation as a security measure, that's probably not a, a good response. And I have heard people say that, well, we can't have our users looking at our unminified JavaScript. And my response is usually there's already unminifiers. It's already in the public domain. It's already out there. If people really want to reverse engineer your JavaScript and if it's really that important, maybe that logic should be in the server side to begin with. Um, so uh, the other point is that at Shopify, we published source maps up to production, and it actually significantly benefited our support team because when JavaScript stack traces come in and, and there's a, a thing that breaks, they don't map back to the minified file, they're mapping to the original source files, and that you know aids in debugging. We get our time to fix uh, and time to analyze what the problem is a lot faster because we have those source maps in production. So whenever you load it in Chrome, is it loading 
I guess is the browser rendering off the map file or off of the minified file? The browser is rendering and, and parsing and operating off the minified file. Um, the only time the map file comes into play is if you actually click that sources tab in Chrome DevTools. Uh, and then you basically purely for debugging. Uh, Lineman is configured, at least in the Lineman Angular template, so that it uses um, a property of the source map called sources content. Typically, other uses of source map will actually map back to the individual files, which you would then have to load on your production server. Um, sources content allows you to inline the, the, the entire source tree in the single map file. Uh, what it means is your map file is typically bigger. Our map files on Shopify in production are about um, one meg or two megs. Uh, but then, given that they're only ever loaded if somebody opens Chrome DevTools, it's not really that big of a deal. So. Other questions? Can you um, tell me if there's more differences to Lineman from Yeoman uh, other than just the code generation? Stuff yeah. Um, we've, we've had this question quite a bit. <laughs> and so we actually created a, uh, an answer to it on here, which has a, tree, uh, a table that kind of walks through what the main differences are. Um, but I can kind of walk you through it. So I mentioned code generation. Uh, Lineman's paradigm is that we have that one built-in scaffold that's basically really intended to introduce you to the development workflow and the, um, the folder structure, and that's about it. Uh, Yeoman has no built-in scaffolds, but it has different generators that will actually generate out the project templates. Um, in addition, it also has generators for individual pieces of uh, an application framework. So it can generate you like a... Uh, an Angular controller, for example. We don't do any of that um, because we don't believe that code generation is, is a sustainable model for building an application. Uh, it's great for sort of exploratory testing, um, but uh, when you're talking long term, I think uh, code generation hides the sort of interaction that the developer has with their code. Um, also, Yeoman doesn't wrap any of the command line tools that it works with. Uh, so when you run commands, uh, grunt tasks, for example, you use the grunt command line. Lineman wraps the, the task, so you can delegate out and say Lineman grunt. Um, the reason we do that is because we are uh, modifying the runtime environment with those configuration defaults, uh, and so we have to, to sort of have Lineman as the entry point for that, uh, for what we're doing. Um, we've also got things that Yeoman doesn't have, like the push state simulator, um, API stubbing and prototyping and proxying, uh, all of the Lineman Angular template uh, endpoints that you saw getting hit with the XHR, like the login and logout, those were stubbed endpoints in that server.js file. Uh, and you can also then proxy um, by running Lineman on, say, a different port uh, from your actual backend, so that requests can go from uh, your rich app uh, in development over to your server side, and it appears as if it's running uh, in concert, but it's not. Uh, and then your deploy step is basically Lineman build and you know put those static assets in the right place for your server side framework. Um, yeah, there's a couple of other issues or uh, differences in there. Basically, we're a little bit more opinionated about um, threat task lifecycle over all of our templates uh, because it's intended to give you a common lifecycle framework for uh, development and deployment uh, regardless of what application framework you're using. Um, all of those opinions would be generator specific in Yeoman because all of the Yeoman temp uh, templates and generators are created by different members of the community. We've curated all of our templates sort of just with a couple of us that had worked previously uh, at Test Double. So okay. Lineman is also intentionally a lot lighter weight. Mm -hmm. Cool. All right, other questions? Awesome. Yeah, nothing else? All right, thanks a lot. Cool, thanks for having me, guys. It was, it was a lot of fun. If you have questions, you can, uh, you can ping me on Twitter. I'm more than happy to answer questions uh, about this stuff. And I've posted some links in the chat there. I've got a bunch of other screencasts on YouTube that, uh, that you can grab um, that cover Angular uh, development, testing in general, um, and front-end development sort of. Uh, I've got one talk called So You Want to Be a Front-End Engineer. If you want to show the, that to people in your organization, it really gives a good fundamental look at browsers and uh, understanding the stack from a front-end development point of view. OK, great. Awesome. Well, uh, thanks a lot. Thanks. And, uh, and then we'll uh, not be meeting in December. So our next meeting will be in January, um, on uh, January 21st. And we'll be having uh, Lee Hambly, the guy that wrote Capistrano.
so he'll be speaking. So, all right. Well, thanks a lot for coming, and we'll see you next time. Thanks, guys. Bye. Uh -huh. Thanks.